I have always wondered why I am so straightforward, meticulous, and a rule follower. What is it? Heredity, environment, or both? But I'm sure my name, Chauncey K. Prendergast, has something to do with it. It may have been hereditary, as both my parents and both grandparents were conservative and unusually fussy. However, since everything the six of them taught me was also conservative, precise, obsessive-compulsive or conformist, it could certainly be due to the environment. It took a lot of time and unusual experiences before I answered this question satisfactorily. Since my family is rich, in addition to being straightforward, rule-following, and meticulous, I have always attended exclusive private schools, where most of the students were similar to me, although not to the same degree. We all wore coats and ties all year, and in warm weather, shorts with creases. At school, I stood out only because of my size. By the 11th grade of high school, actually, college preparatory, my height was 1 meter 96, and my weight was 104 kilo, my adult height and weight. I've never played sports. The only time I ever sweated was when I was playing as a forward in basketball, or as a third winger on the offensive line, or as they call it, a big ass in football, or when I was doing weightlifting to prepare for those sports, always in ironed uniform or workout clothes. I went to Princeton and always wore tailored pants and designer shirts. My hair was always perfectly styled. He never drank beer, only fancy cocktails, and even those in moderation, and was a staunch supporter of the code of honor. I only dated women who were as close to meticulous as I was, maybe even OCD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I took courses that prepared me for life as a proper corporate executive enjoying a good existence in New York City with 2.4 average children and a nanny. I met my future wife, Anastasia Carnegie, when we were both undergraduates at Princeton. She is a large woman, 5 foot 8, 65 kilograms, but even more elegant than large, always impeccably dressed in designer clothes, with regular trips to spas and high-end beauty salons, as befits the daughter of an S&P 1000 CEO. She is a follower of rules and just as respectable as I am. Anastasia and I had a large 400-plus guest, expensive wedding with a reception at the Gramercy Park Hotel, and we started life in an apartment our parents owned in Manhattan, overlooking Central Park, and with a corporate job that made both sets of parents happy. At a corporate job, we had some difficulties, communicating with other employees because they were not like us, but we managed and did not humiliate them. Although I would say that both Anastasia and I enjoyed life to the fullest, perhaps it was because we did not know what else life had to offer us. Our sexual encounters were enjoyable, but not even close to devastating. All our friends were like us, conservative, designer clothes, corporate jobs, etc. Anastasia and I had been married for three years and were both 26 when we went to a popular resort in North Carolina for a week, mostly for fun, but with one business meeting each of us. The resort had an excellent reputation, although it was not official like the usual five-star resorts we frequented, especially with our parents, such as the Greenbrier or the Four Seasons at Jackson Hole or the Grand Hyatt Kauai Resort and Spa. The clientele was much more eclectic than we were used to, but none of us considered ourselves snobs or bigots, even if some others might consider us as such. So, just like at work, we didn't feel judged or uncomfortable. There were a few couples that particularly intrigued us, since in our sheltered upbringing we had never interacted with such people. One couple consisted of a tall, thin, elegant black man and a wiry Asian woman with unusually large breasts. The other is a muscular black woman who looks like Serena Williams and a skinny older white guy with long hair and pink glasses. Another was an always provocatively dressed little white woman with a pretty face red-green hair and obvious body piercings, paired with a little white guy who also had piercings, blue hair, and outrageous outfits. I found the last couple especially interesting. I often glanced at the woman and sometimes noticed that she was looking at me. Several times we even exchanged smiles, but without words. I especially enjoyed watching her when she danced to the fast music. She was extremely athletic and energetic 
Anastasia and I had a good time, participating in many activities and going out into nature, as well as dining and dancing most of the evening at the resort. I think it was the fourth evening of our stay, fortunately after we had each had one business meeting, when an unusual event occurred. One of the changes included a seafood dish that I didn't like, and I warned Anastasia not to eat it. However, she loved seafood and knew I didn't like it, so she brushed off my concerns. We were having dinner with another couple, dressed almost as conservatively as we were, when during dessert, about twenty minutes after we had finished the main course, Anastasia began to have seizures. Her condition progressed to a flushed face, hives, and then, right at the table, vomiting. The frightened waiter and head waiter rushed to her, but soon their attention was directed to other parts of the establishment, to other people with the same reaction as Anastasia. All hell broke loose in the dining room. Once I had Anastasia cleaned up, a very unpleasant task for someone as meticulous as I was, I carried her up to our room after the resort's assistant manager, now in the dining room dealing with this shit show, assured her that the staff doctor would promptly attend to us in our room. After Anastasia vomited again in the bathroom of our room, I took off her outer clothing and put it in our bed. Soon the doctor arrived. It seems he diagnosed the problem right away because many other people have suffered the same fate as Anastasia. Seafood poisoning from mackerel. The doctor gave Anastasia a sedative cocktail, which alleviated the symptoms and put her to sleep. By the time the doctor was ready to leave five minutes later, Anastasia was snoring so loudly it sounded like a freight train. How long will she be out, doctor? At least ten hours, perhaps twelve. Is it important that I stay here with her? I can't sleep because of the noise she makes. No, she will be passed out and does not need supervision. Ask the assistant manager for a different room and just check it every three to four hours. I kissed Anastasia on the forehead, made sure she was covered with a sheet and blanket, and then went to the assistant manager. Although the assistant manager was reluctant to give me a different room, she gave in when I pointed out to her that the resort was responsible for the bad food and that we had one of the most expensive rooms in the area. She offered me an unoccupied regular room. I checked the available room, and it was nice enough to sleep for a few hours between checking on Anastasia. However, I was too energized to sleep, so I went to the main bar. The only empty seat at the bar was next to an older guy in a fancy suit that I had never seen before, and a small woman in provocative clothes, with a beautiful face, body piercings, and red and green streaks of hair, whose purse was holding the seat. Is this place reserved? I asked. Yes, for you, she giggled. I sat next to her and ordered a Moscow mule. The little woman looked at me. Isn't it your wife who started this shit show in the dining room? She asked with a grin. I'm afraid so, I replied. Then you'll probably run out of your room like I did, because my husband is completely out of it after the doctor's visit and won't wake up for another twelve hours or so. Does he snore as loudly as my wife? Of course he snores. I can't imagine how I can sleep with such noise. I rented another room, so I hope to get at least a few hours of sleep between checks. Well, aren't you thoughtful? She giggled. By the way, what is your name? I asked, holding out my hand. I think today I'll go by Calamity Jane, and you'll go by Paul Bunyan. She replied with a devilish grin shaking my hand with a surprisingly strong grip. Paul Bunyan and Calamity Jane, right? I laughed. You seem to be interested in American folk tales. I then proceeded to have one of the most unusual conversations of my life with Calamity Jane. I could tell from the things she said and her vocabulary that she was actually smart, and I wasn't surprised that she graduated from Oberlin College, an excellent liberal arts college that is a hotbed of liberalism and individuality. It was also clear that her family had money too, not only because she and her husband could afford $750 a night at the resort, but also because her clothes and handbag, although very fancy, were clearly high-end, and talk of travel to Europe and Africa indicated a significant amount of travel. It was quite difficult to determine her age, but I estimated it to be between 29 and 31 years old, Calamity Jane and I enjoyed two leisurely drinks, the second of which she allowed me to buy her, before she jumped off the stool and giggled. I'm going to take a nice walk along a trout stream 
and maybe even get my toes wet. Join me, Paul Bunyan, in case I need protection, won't you? But we don't need blue oaks. How can I refuse such an invitation? I grinned. I didn't expect it, but Calamity Jane grabbed my hand as we walked and pressed herself against me, ostensibly for support, since her five foot five, fifty one pound body was wearing four inch heels. As we walked, she told me lewd jokes, outrageous stories, and comments about the flora and fauna we encountered, despite the lack of light except for the full moon. When we reached a low bridge over a trout stream, she took off her shoes and splashed in the water with her bare feet. She urged me to join her, which was not a typical activity for me, but since I enjoyed her company, I agreed. After getting a couple of fish bites on our toes, we put our shoes back on, I just put my socks in my pockets, and crossed the bridge. When we were at a distance, she turned to face me. You know, Paul, I've been looking for the ideal candidate for a one time for a long time. I decided that it would be you. What's a one-shot calamity? Never heard of this. This is a one-time experience that will never be repeated, which will never be talked about, which is completely outrageous and unusual, something that the people involved would never do except for an experience that would broaden their horizons, she smiled. And no further contact. What exactly is experience? I thought. Close your eyes and extend your left hand to me, she ordered, taking off her shoes and standing on the curb of the path so that she was only a few centimeters shorter than me. When I hesitated, she asked, I'm not going to hurt you, Paul. Do what I say. I thought it was funny, and I complied. After I closed my eyes for a few seconds, she pulled my hand towards her, and it came into contact with something wet and soft with a hard part along a larger soft part. The sensation was pleasant, and I continued to close my eyes until I heard Calamity Jane moan and tremble slightly. I opened my eyes and saw that her eyes were closed and that she was moving the fingers of my left hand under her dress. I tried to gently pull my hand away, but she wouldn't budge and held my wrist so tightly that I would likely yank her from where she was standing and hurt her in the process. Her eyes opened briefly, and then she said, Wait until I finish. I believe that within the next thirty seconds she climaxed, also because I myself began to move my fingers. Anyway, she fell on top of me and I had to carefully pick her up and set her on her feet. She looked at me with partially glazed eyes. For the last nine or ten years I have been dreaming of a one-time sex session and you are the perfect man for this. Let's go to your spare room. When I began to stutter in protest, she grabbed me by the neck and mounted me with the ease of a monkey clinging to its mother, wrapping her thighs around my torso. When she kissed me on the lips, I noticed a piercing on her tongue. I can't explain it, but I was instantly aroused, and I think she noticed it by the enthusiastic response of my tongue. When she broke our kiss, she said with a devilish grin, If you like my tongue then you will like my piercing in an intimate place. What exactly happened from that moment until I closed the door of my room behind us, I don't know exactly. I seemed to be in a trancey and walk it as if in a fog. However, once in the room, my mind cleared when Jane announced, To start our one-off, I'm going to do the fastest striptease in history. Then Jane began to sing, Ta-da-da-da, ta-da-da-da, ta-da-da-da moving her hips provocatively for a few seconds before she reached behind her and unzipped her dress. When it hit the floor, she was naked, except for a piercing and a butterfly tattoo, right above what I assumed was a private piercing. Since she was a small woman, I was surprised that her breasts were quite impressive. I would guess they were a size two. My manhood in my pants became so hard that it hurt. Now let me undress you, big boy Paul, she chuckled, walking towards me. Feel free to massage my breasts while I do this, she giggled. She took off my jacket, tie, shirt, and t-shirt, occasionally giving instructions on what to do with her breasts, or ooing and ahing. I like your big muscles. Next came my belt, after which she pulled down my pants and boxers at the same time, causing them to fall to the floor. Yum, yum, she giggled, massaging my manhood, but said with playful concern, I hope this hog fits inside me. Jane pushed me onto the bed, 
pulled down my shoes, pants, and boxers, then came on top of me and began kissing me furiously, stroking my shoulders with her hands and pressing her hips against mine. I think she sensed that I was about to explode from just doing this, so she pushed me away. Tackle my piercing below to prepare me for your hog. Her piercing looked attractive and intriguing. I'd only had this type of sex about half a dozen times with Anastasia, and it wasn't much fun, but judging by Jane's enthusiasm, I thought it might be different with her. And so it turned out, after Jane experienced her first climax with a scream that would have been heard three rooms away if she hadn't muffled it with a pillow, I really got into it. This happened because she swore at me and said dirty words, but primarily because she clearly enjoyed it. Her enthusiasm and joy spurred me on too, and by the time she reached her third climax, I was enjoying it. Even though I thought she would be exhausted after three climaxes, she quickly recovered, pushed me away, and then growled, pushing me onto my back. I'm going to ride you like a rented mule. I don't know how long it took before my hog sank all the way in. We were both surprised that it was even possible given her external dimensions. But the sensation was simply fantastic. I reached the finish line and fired like a howitzer. But she didn't stop. For the first time in my life, after another five minutes of her sexual gymnastics, I remained hard, and again I came to the finish line. And this time she reached the finish line almost at the same time as me, screamed, and then fell on my chest. It took me a long time to recover from the most intense experience of my life. She lay there kissing my lips, neck, and face. That was very, very, very nice, Paul Bunyan, she giggled between kisses. I can't wait for the second round. Finally, she rolled off me, and we began a very flirtatious, provocative, and enjoyable pillow talk. Suddenly, right in the middle of her sentence, her eyes opened wide and she smiled. It's time for me to get to work, she giggled. The second round shocked me no less. I lost count of her climaxes and marveled at her ingenuity. And when I came to my release, I experienced feelings of delight that are difficult to describe. After we came to our senses, we crawled under the covers for the first time and quickly fell asleep. I don't know how long I passed out, but I woke up to Jane, shaking me. Get up, sleepyhead. It's time to visit our spouses. She must have had an internal alarm clock because it had been almost exactly four hours since I met her at the bar. We quickly got dressed, and after she kissed me passionately just before leaving the room, she said, You better be back here in 15 to 20 minutes. I'm not done with you yet, and I wouldn't want to look for you. Since it's a one-shot, I want to get the most out of it that I can. I checked Anastasia. She was in the exact same position I had left her in four hours ago, making the exact same loud train noises. She almost never snores, so the food poisoning and the sleep-inducing, symptom-relieving cocktail her doctor gave her must have affected her, causing the muscles in the roof of her mouth, tongue, and throat to relax so much that they partially blocked her airway and vibrated. I made sure she was properly covered, kissed her forehead again, and left. As I walked out the door, I obviously felt a pang of guilt and had a fleeting thought of not returning to my nest but the pleasure chemicals coursing through my brain soon overcame my hesitation, and I returned. Calamity Jane returned to our little nest almost at the same time as I did. As a wife? she asked. Sleeps like a baby, making loud train noises, I answered. Same thing with my husband, she giggled. Then she pulled out a silicone object from behind her back. This will give us even more pleasure, Paul, she giggled again. Why not? I thought. Today there are many firsts. We need to take a shower before we continue our activities. She smiled, and her dress was removed before the word shower came out of her mouth. I kept up. Although Anastasia and I had showered together before, it was rare, and nothing like this time. Wrapping a towel around herself, she muttered, Take me to bed. I love being in a man's arms. In bed, I did everything she asked. She reached two quick climaxes and began to use the item she had brought. What I felt during this round was beyond description, and when we climaxed again, she screamed and then lost consciousness. She collapsed on the bed, temporarily came to her senses and muttered, 
I hate you for frying every nerve ending in my body. Then she kissed me passionately and buried her face in my chest. After a few seconds, we both passed out and fell asleep. In addition to being the most multi-orgasmic woman on the planet, Calamity Jane must have had the best internal clock because three hours later she was shaking me awake. It's time to check on the spouses again, she muttered, kissing me. Ugh, we both need to brush our teeth before we go back, she giggled before we repeated the same procedure as the first time. And again, Anastasia lay in exactly the same position and snored in exactly the same way. I brushed my teeth, felt another fleeting sense of guilt until the dopamine in my brain washed it away and soon returned to Calamity Jane. Returning to our nest for sex, we did it again. We looked into each other's eyes and this time we had sex with less aggressiveness than before, but with real meaning. When we reached the finish line almost simultaneously, we both moaned for a good ten minutes before the feeling of final euphoria wore off. As we were about to go back to sleep, Jane gave my vanity a great boost when, gently stroking me, she whispered, You're the biggest dude, in every way, I've ever been with. I love all your muscles. It's a pity that this is a one-time thing, and after another kiss... She fell asleep in my arms. This time, we woke up at the same time. Our spouses slept a little over ten hours. We quickly showered together, got dressed, and then kissed one last time as I lifted her off the ground so our eyes were eye-level before we left to return to our spouses. Thank you for the night of my life, I said sincerely before setting her down on the floor. The only one in history, she answered. Now we don't know each other. Remember? Okay, I grinned, and we went in different directions. When I returned to my room, my brain was foggy. I sat in a soft chair, looked at Anastasia, and thought about how I could make amends to her. Some ideas popped into my head that made me smile. She woke up 30 minutes after I returned. I held her close to me, then carried her into the bathroom, undressed us both, and we took a shower to get her clean and alert. After breakfast, Anastasia felt better, but still wasn't quite there, so she asked if we could hang out by the pool, take a few short walks, and just relax. I happily agreed, as Calamity Jane had temporarily drained a lot of my vitality. After dinner, Anastasia was not ready to dance much. We spun around the floor a bit, during which I exchanged a couple of secret smiles with Jane, who was dancing with all her might, while her husband had about the same energy as Anastasia and I. When we returned to the room, Anastasia put on her nightgown and was about to doze off when I said, let me spoil you a little first. I gave her a foot massage, which she really enjoyed, and then a back massage, which almost made her doze off. Then I turned her over onto her back and lowered myself down on her. She protested weakly, but since she passed out, she could not stop me. After five minutes, she no longer wanted to stop me and just muttered, yes, yes, yes. For the first time in my memory, I really, really enjoyed caressing and pleasuring her. And despite her discomfort, she was more grateful and enthusiastic than ever before. We both enjoyed it so much that I brought her to a second climax, which was so intense that she almost passed out. And then we continued. She was too tired to take an active part, but it was clear that she was having great fun. And when I exploded like a volcano, she too soared to the heights and again lost consciousness for a moment. It was our most amazing night of sex ever. When Anastasia and I returned to New York, I had a different outlook on life. Considering how different Calamity Jane was from me and how much I enjoyed her company, I was more open to others at work and in social situations. I was surprised that my new attitude helped me succeed at work and enriched my life. What also helped enrich my life was that Anastasia and I began having sex that lasted longer and was more varied and intense. In fact, I think Anastasia had the best night of her life when I used the poses that Calamity Jane taught me. The smile on her face when we fell asleep, exhausted, was simply touching. Although I had always been kind to Anastasia throughout our relationship, the guilt associated with my one time 
prompted me to be even kinder to her. After a few months, she noticed the difference and complimented me. By the time we returned about four months later, I was no longer thinking about Calamity Jane Horley, but now usually only once a day. Apparently, the blissful relationship I had with Anastasia had clouded her brain a little, because when she threw up one morning, even though she clearly wasn't sick, she went to the OBGYN. Only then did she realize that she had mixed up the sequence of contraceptive injections, and since she had recently changed doctors, she had not received a notification. Although the fact that she was pregnant stressed her out until we found ourselves together one night, after I overwhelmed her by telling her how wonderful it was, and then proceeded to have her until my mind was blown, she accepted impending motherhood. Things were going well for me at work. Thanks to our parents' wealth, Anastasia was able to quit her job and focus on our bambino. Our sex life was great as pregnancy had boosted her libido, and most of my guilt after the one time had dissipated. Then, about nine months into our trip to the resort, I received a message on Instagram. How the hell she knew how to contact me on Instagram, I have no idea, probably from going through my wallet or phone, but Calamity Jane, or whatever her name was, texted me with a photo. In the photo, she, now with long brown hair, which made her face even more beautiful, smiled while breastfeeding her baby girl, while her husband smiled in the background. The text read, My husband doesn't know that he is sterile, and that this is not his child. Don't tell him and don't save this message, let it disappear after 24 hours. You make really good kids, thank you. I almost lost consciousness. For the first time in my life, I was nervous. I didn't know how the hell to deal with it. All my friends, especially Anastasia, asked it if something had happened. Of course, I couldn't say, oh, I'm just trying to figure out how I feel about the fact that the woman I had a one-off with nine months ago just had a baby with me. I tried to reply on Instagram to find out Jane's real name, but the account was deleted less than 24 hours after I received the message. Finally, one Saturday afternoon, while Anastasia was visiting her parents getting ready for her baby shower, after an intense weightlifting workout, I had a meeting with myself. I told myself to be brave, that Jane wasn't asking me for anything, just telling me something I really needed to know that I'm going to dedicate everything I have to Anastasia and the children she and I will have, and that I just have to move on. And I successfully moved on. Anastasia and I's little girl, whom we named Carol, no more fancy names in our family, was happy. My relationship with Anastasia was wonderful on every level. She was pregnant with our second girl. We moved to the suburbs and enjoyed life there. My career went on as usual, and I rarely thought about my one-time experience. As you understand, there always comes a but, and it comes. I was sitting in my office around 10.30 a.m. It had been about 29 months since I received the missing Instagram post from Calamity Jane when my secretary called me over the intercom. Miss K, Jane has come to see you. She doesn't have an appointment. I didn't know any K. Jane, and was racking my brain trying to figure out who it could be when it dawned on me. Oh, God, please no was my silent cry. Clark, are you still there? asked my secretary. Now I was so not picky and not meticulous that I forced the employees who worked for me to call me by my middle name, Clark. Um, yeah. Stephanie, sorry, I got distracted for a second. Please send her. Calamity Jane walked into my office with a big smile on her face. Although she still had piercings on her body, she looked even better with her long brunette hair than when I saw her at the resort, now over three years ago. How are you, Paul Bunyan? She giggled, walking up to me as I sat at my desk, squeezing my bicep and kissing my cheek before sitting down in my chair. Why so red? She giggled. Um, maybe because I'm shocked to see you. We had a one time... Remember, something you carefully explained to me was done so that it would never happen again, and no contact in the future, I replied in what I hoped was a stern voice, although, frankly, I was too scared to be strict. Sorry about that, she replied, not looking sorry at all. I needed a father as soon as I found out that my husband was infertile. I was at the resort during my fertile period, and I really liked your appearance and posture. I thought, 
Why not? And then everything fell into place when we had that story with food poisoning. I realized that the gods were smiling at me. I think we had a great time. Uh, well, great time. Uh, that's not the point, I stuttered, remembering that time. Why are you here? Well, she cooed, then stood up from her chair, walked over to mine, spun me around a little, and then sat down on my lap. I need another bambino. If I don't get pregnant soon, my husband will test himself and then find out that Susan is not his father. We can't allow this to happen, can we? She giggled and then stuck her tongue in my ear. The middle of next week will be my most fertile period, and I will be in Boston. You have clients there. I'm sure you can arrange a business trip for Wednesday or Thursday. I need a second one shot. Returning from Boston and nine months later confirmed by another fleeting Instagram post of Calamity Jane breastfeeding her second little girl, I promised myself, as nice as two one-shots may be, I swear that three one-shots will not happen. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.